Hello, um, I'm Carol Popper. I'm the president of the Royal Economic Society. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce you to the fourth in our webinar series dealing with the issues around COVID-19. Today's webinar is entitled Education and Lockdown, Skills, Transitions and Inequalities, and has two speakers, Professor Simon Burgess from the University of Bristol and Professor Anna Vignoles from the University of Cambridge. And I'm delighted to uh, have them both talk to us. So at this point, I will hand over to Simon. Okay, uh, thanks very much to Carol and to the RES for the opportunity to talk about schools. Last week's two very eminent speakers both emphasized the importance of education and Anna and I are here today to talk about that. I want to just start by briefly rehearsing why education is so important. So obviously for one individual, it matters for their qualifications and for their lifetime earnings. But for an economy, for a country, <clears throat> it also matters a huge amount. A country's stock of skills causally matters for their growth and prosperity. The distribution of skills matters for the distribution of earnings and so inequality. The availability and the quality of educational opportunities in disadvantaged neighborhoods matters for social mobility. And education, again, matters causally for well-being and for personal fulfillment. Of course, only an economist would put that at the bottom of the list. This is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the educational cost of lockdown through closed schools, learning at home, and then the specific circumstances of the graduating cohorts in schools, people who are finishing their time in school. Then I'm going to talk about how we might manage schools through the end of the lockdown. And then I'm going to <coughs> finish up with brief discussion of what's going on um, in, uh, in some other countries. So I want to just start by, um, you know, emphasizing that schools provide a lot of things. Schools help improve social skills and social awareness. They help the students um, <coughs> display and, and develop their creativity and their ability in sports and so on. But from a policy point of view, the most important thing that schools do is they increase a child's ability. They, they improve their skills. So the kind of the benchmark question here is, what is the skill loss from missing 12 weeks of school, if that, if that is what happens, turns out to be the case in, in, in the UK? Um, that's what we're going to have a, have a go at answering. Just written here to compare, <clears throat> for example, although 12 weeks sounds a lot, I guess, particularly if you are a parent at home with your children. Um, that's really quite small relative to the amount of school time lost in the Ebola crisis in West Africa. So we, there are two uh, relevant and useful pieces of evidence uh, that we could find on this. The first is Carlson and colleagues in 2015 looked uh, at students in Sweden and, and there was a situation with random differences in time to prepare for a very important test. Um, Victor Lavi, also 2015, and he looked at international variations in the amount of instructional time in school. So again, the amount of time that you get teaching to prepare for a test. Now, I'm sure entirely coincidentally, looking at both of these studies from a 12 week perspective suggests that 12 weeks of missed schooling means a, a loss of skills of around about 6% of a standard deviation. Now, those of you who, who work in the economics of education will know that 6% is not a trivial number. Uh, Goodman's paper in 2014 suggests that, uh, in fact, schools, if they're given time, they can recover some of this lost learning. And his results suggest that in the end, after some recovery time, uh, the, the, uh, the skills loss was, was rather less. So I want to emphasize that the, this number is extremely approximate. We're extrapolating wildly outside the range of normal variation for both of those studies. <coughs> okay, so all we're trying to do is to produce a sort of general measure of how much skill loss there will be rather than a precise estimate. Um, 
And of course, even so, that's an average effect. There are going to be variations around that average. And one of the most important variations is, uh, is age. Both of those studies um, were for uh, older students, and there's going to be a bigger effect than that, more than 6% of a standard deviation for younger children. They're on a much steeper kind of trajectory of learning, and so the, the loss of the time there is going to be uh, much more important. Also want to emphasize that, again, as apart from the, the loss of skills, schools provide food, um, which is going to be important for some groups of students, uh, friendship, place for exercise, indeed a place of safety. And so that's the loss of school is going to affect mental and physical well-being uh, as well, again, as the loss of skills. So the schools are shut, so the children are uh, attempting to learn at home. So we have a phrase, homeschooling, and homeschooling kind of produces a nice warm image of the parent and the child learning together. Um, <clears throat> and indeed, this can be very successful in normal times. Obviously, we're not in normal times. And as of mid-April, the World Bank estimated that around about one and a half billion students worldwide were attempting to learn at home. Now, of course, we know that families are central to education and they provide really important inputs into a child's learning. Um, typically, though, that's as a complement that sits alongside the school's inputs uh, rather than being the primary driver of learning. OK, so we, there are two big issues about whether um, learning at home is going to go well or not, whether it increases inequalities and whether it's actually going to work at all for many of the students. I think right now um, the different experiences of education at home are as of education are as polarized as they've been for a, quite a while. Yeah, I hear um, stories of um, from from parents whose children go to private schools, and for for them it seems that it's more or less business as usual, other than the fact obviously that the child is at home. Um, <clears throat> they have actual lessons with their own teachers, their own classmates. Uh, they have uh, lessons throughout the day, homework is set, homework is submitted, it is marked and returned. So their education is proceeding not far off normal. On the other hand, I suspect there are a lot of families and not even just all those at the very poorest end of society where there's actually very little being learned at all. So that, that polarised experience comes from a number of differences not least from a, having a quiet place to study in, in your home. <clears throat> you know, there you are, you may be very determined that you're going to carry on learning, um, but then your irritating younger sibling uh, comes along and disturbs you and, and it, all goes, it all goes wrong. So having a quiet place to study is important. How much time your parents can spare to help you study, to help you learn, to help you with something you're stuck on. Some parents are home, May, uh, may have time. Many of them are actually trying to work as hard as normal whilst being at home. The knowledge of parents, their <coughs> um, knowledge of what you're learning. So a very, very recent study by Boll for the Netherlands suggests that that's one of the prime constraints that parents who themselves have maybe not had very high levels of education are really struggling to help children learn similar sorts of things. And then there's the non-cognitive skills of parents, their empathy, their patience, their ability to understand why their child does not grasp this particular bit of algebra or something. And then there's the, there's the IT resources, um, internet stuff that you need to make, to make this work. And I put this at the bottom of the list. This is the one that actually gets most of the, the coverage and that politicians and policymakers can talk most about because they can do something about that. They can just provide the kit. There really isn't anything that they can do about the other, the other factors. So although this gets all the discussion, I put it at the bottom of the list, I certainly don't think it's the most important. So already we're starting to get some data. Uh, Becky Montacute for uh, the Sutton Trust for this country Ola Doyle for Policy Island, as I said, Bold for the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> it's great, we're already learning a little bit about, about these inequalities. Here are just two statistics for you. Twice as many middle-class children take part in live or recorded lessons than do poorer children. A third of children do not have their own network device. So even, even more ballparky than the, than the previous number, I, I reckon that um, the increase in skills inequality um, maybe around about 10% over a 12-week period. 
Um, so maybe that doesn't sound like very much, but for just a 12 week period, it, it seems to me to be a very high number. Will home learning actually work? Will much actually happen? Um, I think what most schools are doing, working really hard, schools and teachers, to provide links to online resources for their, for their families, for their, for their children, their students. But of course, this requires parental co-production. Um, and this requires all of the kind of the inputs that I mentioned on the previous slide. And the ability of schools and teachers to generate bespoke stuff for their own kids that works well online is going to be very variable. Some teachers will be brilliant at it and dive right in. Others will be really struggling. So I think the point is that teaching needs teachers. One of the big discoveries that we've been making over the past decade and a half in the economics of education is that teacher effectiveness is extremely important for learning. And I think actual lessons from actual teachers are going to be very, very helpful in helping the kids learn. It gives a structure um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a professional, it's an actual teacher doing the teaching. So I'm very pleased that the, the UK government have set up uh, an institution to do pre precisely this, the Oak National Academy. Um, and there's the link. Um, and I, I've heard very good, very good stories about how that's working out, provides lessons across the curriculum all of the years uh, and new stuff every week. OK, so moving on to uh, the very specific issues facing the, the graduating cohorts. <clears throat> the cohorts of students who are aged 16 and 18 in, in this country who are taking really important exams would have been taking really important exams at the end of their time in school. And these, these matter a great deal. Um, <clears throat> these, this is about resource allocation. This is about which students are going to get more investment in human capital, which students are going to get jobs, which jobs and so on. So these are, these are really big important uh, decisions that are made on the basis of these qualifications. So what should we do? Can, should we just cancel them, postpone them, take them later in the year, cancel and replace? In the UK, the relevant institution, the uh, Ofqual, says we're going to use teacher assessments plus some degree of normalization around that. And I think, I think teacher assessments are right. I don't really think there is any other alternative. But the worry is that um, non-blind teacher assessments can be biased relative to um, just taking an exam where it's all completely uh, anonymous. So there's quite a lot of work uh, in different countries around the world showing that. I'm just gonna illustrate it with um, some uh, data from a paper I did with Alan Greaves a little while ago. So this is, not, um, this is not particularly recent data, but it just illustrates the point. So what I've got here is some data from the mass performance of 11-year-old uh, kids. <clears throat> and for that performance, we have a, a teacher assessment, TA, and we have a test, uh, an exam, uh, a key stage test, so KS. And what I'm displaying here are the numbers on either side, those children uh, who um, did better than the teacher assessment in the test, and those students who did less well in the test than the teacher assessment. And of course, in no normally you'd expect some variation. Clearly, from you can see that um, most of the distribution, uh, the test and the, and the teacher assessment give the same answer. So we're looking at the tails, if you like, here. For non-disadvantaged kids, they're more or less about the same. Okay, they roughly balance out. Sometimes the kid does better than in the, in the test, sometimes worse. But the, the, the data row for uh, disadvantaged children, you can see a very stark difference. These children are almost twice as likely to outperform what their teacher thought they could do than, than to underperform. So this is the worry. This is the worry that we need some adjustment. School-based adjustment that of course they're going to do uh, is very useful. I don't think it'll do everything. So I would really like to see some adjustment based on pupil characteristics. Okay, so moving on to schools and the end of lockdown. So the, the, the high level question is, is a, trying to understand the best thing to do given the interconnections between lives and livelihoods. And that's all very, very complicated. So I'm not gonna talk about a date. I'm not gonna suggest a particular date. But what I am gonna say is that within a set window, within a, within a given time frame, what about the relative timing for schools? My argument is that schools should be released from lockdown relatively early within that window for three reasons. First, because of the loss of skills, as we've been talking about. Second, for the growth of inequality, as we've been talking about. 
And thirdly, because in addition to actually teaching kids, schools provide a very important service called childminding. So you can park your kid in a school and you can go off to work. OK, so we're not going to be able to release many workers from lockdown if they have to be at home looking after their kid. So there's a question of, of timing here. Um, almost half of the employed uh, have got at least one child aged 0 to 18. So we need to take care of what's going to happen to those children really before we can um, uh, start releasing uh, lock, uh, workers from lockdown on a large scale. And of course, some countries have already started their schools back. So Denmark started a return to, to school um, about three weeks ago, 15th of April. Other countries like Italy may not return. So we're learning a lot already about what, uh, what uh, is happening in Denmark. I think the gradual return seems best. I think that's, that's extremely likely as what, what, should we, what we should do to allow spacing out across, across the school space. And obviously it goes without saying we should have as much protective gear and protective procedures as we can, as we can manage to organize by then. So if we're going back gradually, by what criterion? So one idea would be to go back by region, by city. I think that would not be a good idea. Um, the, the graduating cohorts and, and the cohorts just below that, because of the way we mark exams in this country, um, they are essentially competing with one another. So if you have some cities where um, the students go back much earlier than other places, and they're going to get maybe three weeks, a month more schooling, I think that seems unfair. So I would, I would imagine the best thing to do would be to go back gradually by age group. In primary schools, I think perhaps the youngest should go back first, <clears throat> because as I've said, they're on the very steep part of the learning trajectory, and the longer they miss, the greater is their loss to their cognitive skills. In secondary school, I think next year's graduating cohort, the current years 10 and 12, should be the ones who go. I also think it's really important to try and get some education done before the break. So I think we should delay the start of the summer holidays by, I don't know, a couple of weeks um, and not, not increase the, the end of the holidays. So have a shorter summer holiday in order to try and make sure we get some education, <coughs> education done. And then very importantly, after the summer, I think it's really important that we try and avoid permanently scarring uh, the cohorts who've lost some, lost some education time. So we need to try and avoid that permanent skills loss. And one way of doing that is to have explicit catch up lessons after summer from September through Christmas. Um, and, it, and we know how to do this. Small group tutoring um, has very strong uh, RCT based support uh, in this country from EEF and in the United States too. Some very impressive effect sizes. So the idea is that would be targeted. Um, uh, and we wouldn't expect to do that for all children. Uh, it's a lot of children, but we might well expect to do it for maybe a third or the half or half of the kids to try and get them back up to speed, get them back up to where they should be um, by Christmas time. So I think I think that will obviously be expensive, but I think equally um, the rate of return will still be extremely um, uh, worthwhile. So I just wanted to have a very quick look at what some other countries are doing. Um, I engaged in an incredibly expensive and sophisticated data collection procedure by uh, emailing 11 friends and asking them what's going on in their country. I know we haven't got time, I haven't got time to go through all this and, and maybe you won't be able to read all of that in the time. Um, and also uh, the wonderful Shunila Rawal reporting on lots of different countries that she knows about. So I just want to pull out a few differences um, as I kind of wind up here. So Sweden actually hasn't closed schools at all below the age of 16, so they've taken a, a different path. As I mentioned, Denmark has already started back about three weeks ago. Other countries, uh, Germany, I think, have, have reopened or are about to reopen. They've made different decisions about who to start with, some of them starting with the youngest, some of them starting with the cohorts who will take exams next year. Other countries are not really expected to return until September. Some of my correspondents have been quite pessimistic about how much learning at home is taking place. Others have been a little bit more optimistic. And again, there have been variations in how these countries have handled what to do about the, the key exams, have, have teacher assessments, uh, have in-school grades, or even just write a new home project that will be judged. So final slide. Um, this is just a quick summary of 
what I think the policies ought to be. Uh, for the graduating cohorts, I think we should be using teacher assessments, but I, I think we should adjust those uh, using pupil characteristics, so beyond just using school-based adjustments. For the other cohorts, um, I'm very pleased that the Oak National Academy is doing what it's doing. I think that's probably being a big help, providing lessons from actual teachers. I think we need to do supplementary investments, as I've described, to avoid uh, permanent skills loss. And then once a lockdown window is set, I think schools need to be released relatively early, gradually released by age groups um, with the early years and, and next year's graduating cohorts going first. Okay, so that's me done on schools. So I'm going to attempt to gracefully exit left and pass you over to Anna Vignoles in Cambridge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, a huge thank you to Carol and to the Royal Economic Society for inviting me to do this talk. Given the previous speakers, it really is genuinely an honour. Um, and we're going to um, focus now on uh, post-compulsory schooling. Could I have the next slide, please? So as we heard from uh, Angus Deaton last week, over and above um, the inequalities uh, that we're seeing uh, emerge, uh, we're seeing a particular dimension on this, which is by education level. So social distancing has been widening gaps in income. Social distancing um, has consequences long term for people's uh, likelihood of uh, returning to work. Mortality differences are also emerging by education level. But perhaps the thing that um, is most striking uh, in terms of the consequences of this crisis is the potential economic impact on the young the uh, intergenerational price here is pretty high, and specifically on the young who will be trying to enter the labour market over the next few years. Hence, that post-compulsory schooling element is really important. And work by the IFS has clearly shown that the young are disproportionately likely to work in the sectors that are more likely to close. Um, and so what we're seeing is an exacerbation of existing intra- and inter-generational inequalities. And that's why I think that uh, the policy on post-compulsory schooling is going to be so vital in our recovery. I have the next slide, please. Um, and there are two aspects to the policy response that we need. The first is we need to obviously think about the, the short run impact of lockdown on both students and institutions. There's been an awful lot of disruption. But in the longer term, I think we need a, a strategy, not a quick response to what we might do to reduce the pre-existing and growing uh, intra inter uh, generational inequalities and and particularly think about the ones that have been exacerbated by the virus have the next slide please so starting uh, with the short run shock if you like um, the short run next slide please sorry thank you um, the short run shock to higher education is fairly substantial um, sorry back one <laughs> I think there's a bit of a lag on the uh, the line there so moving back to the tight slide, tight, thank you. Um, so there's been this uh, short, sharp shock. Um, and it, the expectation is we're going to see a massive decline in the number of students turning up to university next year. Um, or at least that's what people have been saying. And, and genuinely, you can see why that might be. There are safety fears. Uh, there are concerns about the quality of provision if it's online. And looming large are their credit constraints and the cost barriers that uh, students, particularly from poor families, might experience. But I actually think the predictions in this space are, are highly problematic. Uh, the opportunity cost of going to university has pretty much gone to zero, given the likely state of the youth labour market. Um, so students are not exactly uh, going to have a lot of alternatives. Um, further, uh, whilst it's unambiguously the case that international students will be uh, affected by our response to the virus and limitations on travel, it's not clear that a student who's looking at low opportunity cost of going to study uh, in a country like the UK, which has a reasonable level of state support for students to pay for their fees and, and some living costs, um, and who expects the return to a degree to, to not fall over this period, uh, it's not clear why they wouldn't go. Um, but I do think actually that there's a policy response required at ev even in the short run, which is uh, from the sector itself to perhaps communicate some of these issues. Um, the universities are undoubtedly experiencing uh, 
financial uh, concerns and a liquidity issue or potential liquidity issue. They, in the UK, have gone to the government asking for extra support. Um, and one can see the logic of that. Uh, the trouble is, if that then gets communicated to students that universities are not open next year, the financial situation gets even worse. So some tricky decisions about communications there. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, but even if the worst fears about um, the decline in the number of students making the transition into higher education don't come to pass, I'm still extremely concerned on the basis of the evidence um, that there will be an unequal impact uh, for those trying to transition to higher education. Uh, I've already talked about uh, credit constraints. Um, actually, state support is arguably insufficient for the poorest students, um, and those students, as already said, will be working in those sectors that are hardest hit. So if we do nothing, um, and it's likely that students no longer can support themselves by doing paid work, we're going to see uh, even further declines in part-time study and certainly declines in the numbers coming uh, full-time. The second issue is the one that Simon alluded to. There's been a change in the way, well, there's been disruption and a change in the way qualifications are assessed. Um, and just to really highlight that point, the expectation on the basis of work by Murphy and Wyness is that if you rely more on teacher judgment, um, they are likely to underestimate the grades of poor students. And we might be concerned that that will affect student motivation as well as ability to progress to higher education. But there is a, a, another sort of potential positive here. Um, given that we are definitely going to see a decline in international students just because of the travel restrictions, um, but universities still need to fill their places, this is a potentially a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, for a big widening participation intervention. In other words, students from poor backgrounds who would normally uh, be able to go to a relatively lower ranked institution, potentially at least could be recruited into a higher status institution um, with a likely positive impact on their earnings. Um, the so-called undermatch problem, which is that poorer students tend to make less ambitious choices, uh, may feel more constrained, may be less well informed, may be less likely to take risks. And for all those reasons, they end up in institutions that if you were like below their potential ability, again, with the right concerted action, we could use this moment to try and ensure that they trade up in terms of institution. Uh, but it's interesting that the debate on this has been rather countered by uh, those in the sector who are understandably worried about destabilizing it. So in other words, if the high status institutions suck up all the students from underneath to fill their places in lieu of international students, institutions at the bottom of that hierarchy may fail. And so again, we have some serious decisions to make about um, arguments in favor of the stability of the sector versus potential interventions to help individual students. Next slide, please. So as is often the case in uh, the economics of education, we start with higher education, um, but I really want to stress the next point, which is the group that we should be most worried about post this crisis is the 50% of the cohort in the UK, at least, who don't go on to higher education. Um, poorer students, and by that I mean students from whose parents have low income, poorer students are far more likely to take the vocational education route um, and are generally uh, far more likely to have poorer labour market outcomes. So it's important to be really clear, uh, there are vocational uh, and technical qualifications that actually give better returns in the labour market than degrees. So I'm definitely not saying that higher education is always better, um, but uh, on average, those who aren't going to university are more at risk of low income, and again, more likely to work in those sectors that have been so hard hit by the crisis. And even more concerning is those who are pursuing the vocational route have an additional issue, which their training um, is dependent on the involvement of firms. And in fact, when you look at the evidence on vocational education, the most valuable vocational education tends to be the education that has a, a greater involvement um, by firms. And it's that that will be at risk. We know that training is pro-cyclical. So we know that, I mean, at the moment, practically speaking, firms have had to um, terminate apprenticeships or not terminate, suspend apprenticeships. Um, and the question is, can we introduce policy to make sure that firm training and support for apprenticeships continues when we come back um, and how we can support firms to do that? Um, and I'd end on this slide is just saying that, yes, the vocational education training system tends to be rather less dependent on international students, 
So it may not be first in the queue when uh, thinking about a financial bailout, but um, even before COVID, um, it was under far more acute funding pressures than higher education in the UK and in many other countries, including the US. So this kind of route is quite weak in some countries and uh, we need a policy to address that. Next slide, please. So in terms of policy responses, uh, what might we do? So um, in the short run, um, in the UK at least, the university sector has gone to the government asking uh, for help. Um, the response has been uh, to bring forward some cash to solve an immediate liquidity crisis or potential crisis, which is, I'm sure, a relief to some universities. But actually, I think this is the moment to think a bit more strategically about what it is that we want to do. And one can make a clear argument that universities and colleges and investing in universities and colleges is not the same um, as uh, investing in particular firms by subsidy. Um, and there are a number of arguments that are, are, are well rehearsed. The first being that uh, education and arguably including higher education um, is a public good. And Simon touched on this earlier, but um, it, it's perhaps more obvious why primary and secondary education generates huge amounts of value in terms of public good and indeed externalities. Um, it's harder sometimes to make that argument about higher education, but I would have thought that it has been really evident during this crisis just how much of a public good the knowledge created by universities is. When you think about the efforts at the moment uh, in terms of tackling COVID and how much of that is essentially public knowledge generated by universities globally. Um, and maybe we need to do better at recognizing the public good element. There's obviously the externalities and although the economic evidence on externalities is uh, mixed, um, there is uh, evidence that particularly STEM human capital um, can have um, external effects beyond the individual um, and also thinking about the role of institutions in place and regions and again creating externalities that benefit the wider community. But I think focusing on the economic externalities alone really does miss part of the story. We need to also think about the social uh, and whether that's uh, greater cohesion, uh, more engagement in politics, or whether it's public art, um, these things are important, but they're hard to quantify, and some of them are quite politically sensitive. Um, and at the moment, it's very difficult for that argument to be made. But nonetheless, in a moment of crisis, where what you don't really want to see is that the sort of creative destruction of individual institutions going under due to short-term uh, problems, we need to think long and hard why it is that we're subsidizing education to the extent that we might. And then uh, just a couple of points. I mean, in the UK, at least, teaching is subsidizing research. And so if you uh, get a, a shock to one part of the system, it's likely to impact on the other. It seems like it's not a good moment to lose a, a lot of research capacity, given its role in, in post-COVID uh, recovery. Um, and again, just to reiterate the same point, I mean, the evidence is far weaker on, say, the externalities from vocational training um, but that doesn't mean that the social and economic impact of vocational education and training is less. It means that there's been far less evidence of it. Next slide, please. So having argued that we would need to be careful about uh, letting institutions fail at this particular moment, that that sort of you know, destruction of uh, long-standing institutions might be bad, um, more positively, if we start thinking about medium and long-term strategies, um, Angus Deaton raised the issue of whether we should be investing in human capital as one way out of our current uh, problems. Um, and making the standard uh, economic argument, um, it's clear that you would want to focus where market failure is most evident. And um, this is very obviously um, focused, should be focused on those facing the greatest credit constraints. Um, this may not just be students trying to go to higher education, it, it also applies to credit constraints in terms of retraining, lifelong training. Uh, there's been a sharp decline in part-time um, education after the 2008 crash. Um, that's partly because you know, people can't afford to invest in themselves. So there are lots of issues there about where we might alleviate some uh, credit constraints. We'd also want to focus where the social return exceeds the private return. Um, and you know, there are, it's very easy to come up with examples of that. For example, in the UK, nursing degrees um, where the private return is is relatively low and as we're experiencing at the moment the social return is huge 
so we could have a focus on particular types of qualification. Um, the other thing that we need to be clear about and have a policy on, which is the economic benefits of trying to shelter youth at the moment from the worst of the labour market, um, particularly over the next 18 months, where uh, it's likely to be very bad for young people trying to graduate and trying to leave uh, school or leave higher education and, and get work. And the scarring effects uh, from trying to enter the labour market during a recession Are well documented. That's a real issue. And if you took all of those things together, um, you would say that you need to focus where the market failure is evident, social returns exceed private, and uh, entering the labour market, uh, those entering the labour market, you would tend to direct your um, investment on the lower skilled and non-university bound. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and I think this comes to um, a, a big question that we've actually been grappling with in the UK well before COVID uh, came along to dis disturb things. Um, and that is how much we should rely on the economics to guide us in terms of state investment in education. It's a fairly fundamental question. It's easy to talk about public good and it's easy to talk about social returns and externalities. But the reality is, is that you need actual money to flow into institutions or into specific qualifications or into specific students. So it's not enough to, in principle, agree that we should have state investment. We need to decide where that state investment should go. Uh, if we use uh, wages and labour market returns as a guide on that, uh, there are some problems. And I think that's one thing the crisis has taught us is that wages aren't necessarily a good guide to social value. Uh, but wages are a good guide to things like the relative shortage of particular types of human capital and skill. Um, so we need to both think about labour market reforms in terms of what we value, but also how that um, works with a policy to invest in specific aspects of education and qualifications that give um, social and labour market returns. We might also be concerned at the moment that the past evidence on returns uh, are not necessarily a good guide to the future because the long run uh, changes in, in the demand for skills um, might emerge as a result of the crisis. So for example, sectors uh, that decline permanently um, won't need the same uh, skill profile. Um, equally, if migration flows change on a permanent or at least a long run basis, again, we're looking at very different skill needs in the labor markets now than we needed say five years ago. So these are all issues that might give us some pause for thought when using pure uh, labour market returns to guide us. Um, but there is a, a problem here. So we've done a lot of work on higher education, looking at the returns to different degrees. And whilst uh, for men, uh, the return by the time you get to your 30s uh, on a degree in the UK is around about 9%, um, it hides a huge variation. And some recent work from the IFS has suggested that around one in five of graduates um, has earned no return at all to their degree. Now, going back to what I said about valuing the social, it may be that we're very comfortable with the idea that not all degrees lead to higher earnings. However, if we're going to make decisions about uh, investments in particular parts of the education system, we do need something to guide us if we're not relying totally on wages. And the evidence on social returns is particularly limited. So I think this is a real case of, of needing more information, uh, but also what we need to start above all else is a conversation uh, with uh, various stakeholders about the extent to which we want economics and the demand for skills and the demand for human capital in the labor market to be driving what the state invests in. Um, and I would argue myself that obviously it has to drive some of it. Uh, I don't think anybody would want us to invest hugely in lots of um, education and qualifications that yield no labour market return at all. Not least, I don't think students would like us to do that. Um, but we've also got to be very mindful of the other benefits that arise from education and bring them into our decision making. And my final point is that institutions and funding systems really do matter here. And this is nicely illustrated in the UK, 
where for a number of years there's probably been, or there has been, a stronger incentive to pursue the higher education route uh, than, say, a really valuable uh, apprenticeship route. And that's a problem. It means that, you know, a, a significant number, arguably one in five graduates, have ended up taking a qualification uh, that hasn't helped them in the labour market. And more crucially, they might have done something else, say on the vocational side, that would have helped them and would have helped firms obviously uh, get the skills that they need. So we need to think very carefully about what we want to invest in, the criteria we use to make uh, decisions about investments in education. And then we need to ensure that our funding systems and our institutions align with that strategy. So thank you very much. I'll hand back to Carol. Thank you very much, both Anna and Simon, for really stimulating and thought-provoking uh, presentations. There have been a number of questions that have come in. Um, I'll take uh, one for, for Anna first and then one for Simon. So the, the question for Anna, there are, there, there are a number, but I'll start with the first one, which is, Anna, you presented a lot of evidence, you presented a lot of arguments. Um, obviously, the, about where one might want to invest post-COVID. Clearly, one of the backdrops to this is that COVID has exposed inequalities that were already there and were already there in the education system. You've laid them out nicely. If you were to advise government as to where to put their money first, where would you do that is the question. Million dollar question. Thank you, Carol. Uh, very, very important question. So um, I think that we do need it to be guided by uh, some sort of um, return, if you like, human capital return in the decisions we make about investment. And I say that because um, the 50% who don't go to university, uh, particularly in the UK, but also in the US and a few other countries, have real problems in terms of uh, the quality of jobs they get in the labour market. They are an under-resourced group. We haven't spent enough on them. We knew that before COVID came around that we hadn't spent enough. Um, and that's where I would direct my uh, funding. Um, but that group doesn't have a natural voice and the institutions that serve that group don't necessarily have the same amount of uh, authority as um, you know, higher education institutions. So that's why I'd put my money first. And can I ask a supplementary question to that? Do you think we should be forcing the more elite universities to take poorer students this year in favor of the other kind of students that they would normally take and impose if you're worried about the, uh, do you think that would be a good idea? And we already try to do that. So, um, no, I don't think we should be forcing universities to do anything, and I don't think we have to. My argument was that um, generally, particularly elite institutions, are trying to select their students on the basis of their potential, their ability to learn. And universities, uh, in fairness, uh, do this well. And if you take two students with the same A-level grades, um, one from a poor background and one from a rich background. Actually, they have a very similar chance of going to university. They even have a relatively similar chance of going to elite university. So it's not true that universities are in any way discriminating against poor students in that way. But what universities struggle with, of course, is that the poor student is presenting with lower grades. And therefore, it's quite difficult for them to make just decisions to prioritize a student that has, you know, two grades lower than another student. Um, what I'm saying is this is an opportunity where there are uh, vacant spaces essentially because the international students won't be coming um, and we could encourage students who are poorer students to be ambitious in their choices maybe and, and indeed UCAS the application system is trying to do this to some extent we just need to encourage them to be ambitious and to take risks and perhaps trade up um, even if that does leave some problems at the bottom end of the system. Thanks, Anna. Well, I've now got a, a, a rather different question that's come in for Simon, which is to do with um, releasing the lockdown in schools. And um, you were obviously talking about primary schools going, younger children and primary schools going back. And one of the questions that came in was, was what about, well, it's got two parts. One is what about the psychological impact of using protective gear and procedures for children, particularly young children? And secondly, 
how to manage the pressure of extra work on teachers, especially in low income contexts, that the welfare of teachers is not being addressed in the current narratives. How would you come back to those questions? Uh, so it's the, the whole question about how to manage the release from lockdown is obviously incredibly sensitive and complicated. And um, I it was trying to sort of set out some of the the the, the um, some of what to me would be some of the core principles. Um, I think uh, in terms of the youngest kids, we can look at the case of Denmark. Um, they um, uh, started coming, releasing from lockdown about three weeks ago, and they have indeed started with some of the youngest children. Um, so we can learn those lessons. So what they do is they <coughs> they they uh, have they created tiny little groups, maybe three or four kids that you are, and that's your play team. That's who you hang out with. <clears throat> and those those groups are split split up um, from the from the pictures I've seen. Uh, I don't think they wear masks. I think they just sort of hang out, but they don't. There isn't any general mixing, and that's been true, I believe, in classes as well. So I think we can I think we can um, take some advantage from the fact that we're going to be doing this a little later and a little slower than some other countries, and just see um, kind of you know what what other people have done and what worked and what didn't work. So yeah, I mean, I can quite understand. I'm, I'm obviously uh, an economist, not a psychologist, but I can quite understand. It's quite scary for kids. It's actually quite scary for a lot of grown-ups to see a lot of people wandering around in sort of full protective gear. Um, I, I would say that people have probably got used to seeing that over the last few weeks, um, but I'm not in any way trying to sort of belittle that or say or say that that doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, teachers um, <clears throat> teachers have been. Uh, so working hard, most of them, I'm sure, to um, produce material for their for their students um, uh, and trying to produce online material or, or even doing uh, sort of video chats um, in, in some cases. So I'm sure teachers have been definitely not having a holiday, have been working very hard, uh, probably worrying a lot about their own students. So quite what the best way the best way of proceeding for them is, I'm not sure. Um, they're, they're, it's not that they're going to go back to work from doing nothing. And I'm sure they're also quite rightly concerned about their safety as well as the safety of their children. Uh, thank you. Okay, I have another question that I think possibly is, is possibly for Anna, but, but maybe both of you, which is looking at the current situation, what do speakers think about the open university? Um, in as it's always delivered distance education and are there any key ideas from that model that can be used to help students learn during lockdown? So thank you for that question. Um, I think there is a lot we can learn. I mean I think also the Open University uh, will really shine um, as an example of what can be done. Um, and I think it's important that we have that example um, because we need to be very positive with our students that you can deliver um, certainly higher education online uh, or at least partially online. Um, one of the challenges, however, is that the Open University dedicates a lot of resource and time to developing its materials. And we're asking uh, both schools and higher education institutions to do this at pace. Um, and uh, whilst you know, technology helps, uh, it's undoubtedly challenging. Um, and I think one of the things that we're going to have to do next academic year is really think about the value of different elements of our pedagogy. So uh, actually, you know, if you're listening to a lecture, I think it's fine if it's online. In fact, students want to record it and watch it online. So that's relatively straightforward. But that human contact, the smaller group tutorials, uh, we need to uh, make sure that we, if anything, offer more of that to support the students in their learning next year, if we're going to be constrained physically. Can I um, just add to that? So I, I agree with everything Anna just said. I think in terms of schools, um, I, I think we, we do have this new institution, the Oak National Academy, that is trying to do that kind of thing. They're, they're delivering it uh, currently online rather, rather than on TV but otherwise they are actual lessons from actual teachers, um, providing a lot of the curricular material and providing it you know, week after week. So I think, I think that is going on. I think once we start thinking about doing a lot of our teaching in universities um, online, 
then then all sorts of really big questions open up as to you know, what you to go to university where you know if 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 you can access those online lessons kind of anywhere and if we're going to restrict them then why are we going to restrict them then yeah all sorts of big questions come about what does it mean to go to university and that's perhaps oh sorry that's perhaps where we can learn from the OU i mean the OU model is really interesting because and the evidence on MOOCs is interesting it's not enough to put the uh, material online. Students need scaffolding, they need supporting, they need yeah. encouraging through the learning. Um, and so when we say we're talking about putting stuff online, it can't be passive. We need that active support for students. Yeah. I'm sure universities are totally agree. But more so next year. Um, thank you. I have a question and a more a question and behavioral question that's come in, which is we've had very strong messages that we need to social distance, that we need to stay away from each other. And obviously once children start being around, and we also have observed that um, very relatively few children who could still go to school are actually going to school within, for example, vulnerable groups. So the question is what happens if parents are too worried about infections to return their children to school this school year, for example? I agree. Um, maybe if I go first on this one. Yeah, so I agree that that's a very big issue and each parent's going to have to make that decision on the basis of their, of their own child. Um, again, I think um, I think something similar happened in Denmark to start with of the relevant age groups. Um, definitely not all of the parents uh, started their children back. But it's, as I say, it's been going two or three weeks now and um, infection rates seem to be reasonably stable, reasonably flat. And more and more parents are deciding to send their kids along to school uh, the whole time. I, I don't know, I'm afraid, what kind of fractions we're talking about. So again, I mean, that's, that's very clearly a totally appropriate and understandable concern. And I think every parent would, would have that. Um, and uh, I'm sure we would expect the same thing to happen here uh, if and when the schools are reopened. Um, but I think you know, if it goes well, then then increasingly uh, parents will will want to send their children to school. And can I ask you a supplementary question? From my interest is, do you think that has to be accompanied by track and trace, or not? So I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think I think um, in terms of contagion dynamics, um, I it sounds like a good idea, but I, I don't have any sort of thing specific to say in the schools context. At least with a school, you know who's been there. And I guess that makes it a little bit easier. So I'd just add that one thing this crisis has sort of brought to the fore is that it's partly a medical crisis, but it's mostly a social crisis as well in the way that we respond to it. And just as we manage to get people to do something quite remarkable, which is stay in their houses for, I'm not, I don't know how many days it is, a long time, uh, we managed to get them to stay in their houses by and large, uh, and make huge sort of personal sacrifices for particularly in age groups where the risk is very low. Um, and we did that. And now, I guess, or at some point in the next three, four or five months, we're trying to reverse that. Um, and in the same way that we sort of almost terrified people into taking the first action, we need to think very carefully about how we get people to understand that it is moderately or relatively safe to go back. I think we need to move away from a binary discussion. We can't have safe, unsafe. That's just not the way the world is. But I do think we need serious discussions about the long-term uh, de detrimental effects that are coming, not from the, the virus itself, but from the response to the virus. And that is largely a conversation about school children and those uh, people trying to make their way into the labor market. I think that's a group that's particularly hard hit. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Anna and Simon, very much for um, uh, giving us your time, giving us your thoughts and such a wide-ranging discussion. We've actually reached uh, 1.55, uh, which is the scheduled time for the end of this webinar and have no more questions coming in. So it remains for me to say to everybody, thank you for participating. Thank you for joining us. Um, the webinar will be edited and placed on the Royal Economic Society website and the Royal Economic Society YouTube channel within about 48 hours, so that if you want to watch it again, you can do so. And also to trail the next set of webinar series, we've had three next week, on Monday the 11th, Thursday the 14th, and Friday the 15th, all at 1 p.m. Um, and they'll be chaired by Lord Nick Stern,
and um, they will examine the challenges of building a strong, inclusive and sustainable resilient recovery from COVID, focusing on strategy, investment policies and finance for such a recovery. So I think they'll be very much complementary to what we've been hearing over the last four weeks, very much complementary to today's focus on skills and children. And so it remains for me to say thank you very much for joining us and goodbye. Thank you.